Applause for me. Oh, yeah. It's your boy Walter Doom back for another episode of Let's Talk About Horror, the horror podcast where I talk about anything and everything related to the genre. And I got a good show for you guys today. I'm back. We're going to be talking about some news today. We're going to be talking about some 70s movies that I've been watching because that's the main focus of like. What I've been watching since the last month, in the month of June, um, if you have been following my stories on Instagram and what have you, but anyway, we're gonna jump into the news right quick, so, what's going on you guys, how y'all staying safe out there, you know, this whole thing, this whole pandemic thing, it's still pretty much going on, and the thing that we kind of realize is that were we wrong to open up everything so soon? <laughs> I mean, it didn't take much of a rocket scientist to figure out like we might be opening up way too soon for everything. And I mean, maybe because we want to keep this economy going and what have you, but is it really necessary to kind of like take this risk and kind of like possibly contracting this? virus even if you don't believe in it well even if you believe in it or not yo i mean it's so crazy i mean i live out here in california and we were one of the states that pretty much opened up again we opened up our bars and everything we were opening up our gyms opening up the beaches we were opening up a lot of things i was one person that was really not up to going to any of this these places because my first thoughts was well, are we really in the clear? Are we really that safe from this whole virus thing? Is it really over? And I'm pretty sure it's not over. I mean, even once we started opening up everything, I mean, the numbers started jumping again. I mean, unfortunately for us in California, we didn't do anything to kind of like curve the numbers or anything like that. We were just like, okay, well, if Florida is opening up and Texas is opening up and Georgia is opening up again, why don't we open up again? Yeah, I really just thought it was a very bad idea, but it was very ironic to me that in the couple of weeks that they wanted to open up everything, they decided to to close down on 4th of July because they were afraid the numbers might really spike up. Like I said, irony. I mean, it really is ironic that during the 4th, and this is out here in California, I don't know what it was like in other states and what have you, but I'm speaking from my own state. So I find it ironic that here in California that our governor just really didn't give a fuck, that he just wanted to open up everything to kind of get some money coming in again. And... After he realized, hey, people are getting sick way worse than what they were before. Now he wants to kind of like care and don't want to double up or triple up the numbers after the 4th of July weekend. I mean, because it was recorded that after Labor Day weekend or well, not Labor Day, but Memorial Day weekend. The numbers were jumping again. They were jumping high. So... Like I said, whether you believe it or not, whether you believe that this is a real disease or not, I mean, that is totally up to you. I myself don't go anywhere without a face mask because, you know what, there's a slight possibility of catching it. And I don't know where. Well, not a slight chance, but, you know, there's a chance of catching it. And I'm not trying to be out here slipping and what have you without a mask on you know what i'm saying but seems like florida doesn't give no types of fucks because i mean i am recording on sunday and 
pretty much they I believe Disney World has opened it again. So we'll see what happens in the next coming weeks. How much does Disneyland reopening or should I say Disney World reopening affects the guests and the numbers? Because right now they are at an all time high. These motherfuckers lost their mind completely. I mean, they're jumping at 15,000 on a record high in a single day. That's ridiculous. And we are like in a state of, we just really need to be careful of what we do, where we go, and really look out for our loved ones right now. If you don't have to go anywhere, don't go anywhere. I mean, it's funny to see all these Kevins and Karens on social media complaining about wearing a mask and all that shit. And it's just like, to me, like, you look stupid, bro. Like, shut that shit up. <laughs> yeah, this is just a year that we are all hoping that just goes away real quick. And hopefully the real year starts <laughs> in 2021. But even then, I mean, even with 2021 coming, this virus is, has gone anywhere. It's not going anywhere anytime soon until this vaccine comes, which seems like to be the end game of all of this. Either um, we build immunity to it or a vaccine comes and kills it. Well, obviously, it looks like immunity is not doing shit for it right now. So it looks like we have to take our chances with the vaccine. Now, say whatever you want about the vaccine. I mean, that's totally up to you guys. I'm not going to state my opinions about what I think about these vaccines that are supposed to be coming out. But yeah, let's just say 2020 is pretty much canceled. And that means also for like the movie industry, which we are a horror channel, means like a lot of our movies that we were hoping that would come out are being postponed and moved or canceled for another date. Right now, Halloween Kills, according to John Car Carpenter, um, he came out with a letter saying that they're moving Halloween Kills to a new date. So they're moving it now to October 15th, 2021 of next year. So that should be fun, which means that for Halloween Ends, which is the third movie for the Halloween reboot series, that one is now being moved to October 14th of 2022. What's also being moved is the forever purge which was supposed to come out this month which is now being moved to july 9th of 2021 but the only thing that's staying in the 2020 bracket of release is the new candy man by jordan pill and nia da costa which is supposed to come out in october 16th of 2020 now to me honestly I don't know how much faith that these movie theaters are going to have as far as like reopening. I mean, honestly speaking, I mean, I just feel like I'm not really willing to go to like a movie theater anytime soon just because of like how disgusting theaters are anyway. I mean, that, let's, let's be honest. Movie theaters had got to be the most disgusting place to go before COVID even hit. And that should be, and that's just because of all the nasty shit that people do, like leaving trash, gum, you know, sticky seats, sticky floors, and all that types of shit, you know. And I mean, honestly speaking, you know, when theaters have like movies playing very close together, like in in different showing times and all that, uh, they don't really clean up the auditoriums like they should, you know. They don't give it like a real thorough cleaning. So, I mean, to be honest, even before this whole pandemic happened, I mean, who's to not say COVID already existed in the movie theaters? Now, I ain't going to try and like say that it was there. I'm just saying, you know, as nasty as the movie theaters are, I mean, COVID could have been there the whole damn time, you know? 
But I just honestly think like for the movie company industries trying to really release content to the theaters, they really probably should just cancel cancel the plans altogether, you know, and just like maybe shoot for something more on the sense of like releasing things on or releasing movies on streaming sites like Netflix or Amazon Prime or stuff like that. You know, like just give them like exclusive rights to the movie and just have them like show them there. I mean, honestly, it worked for well, it works for the Disney films because it's more of a family thing. And I mean, I get it cuz like families are home, they want to have the kids entertained. So, you got to find something to entertain the kids and yeah, I mean, that's the best way to go about it. But to me, I mean, like, movies like Invisible Man, if, if if Invisible Man could still do well on the streaming sites, which it pretty much did, I mean, even though it, it did good in theaters, I mean, honestly, it was doing more numbers in theaters. I'm pretty sure it was still doing decent numbers on the streaming sites of, like, Amazon and shit like that. But I just feel like they should probably take that route. Why not that? Or just release movies to the drive-ins. I know the drive-ins right now are like a thing (laughs) today. I mean, it's like we're having a major blast in the past. I mean, it's like the world is being reset to like many years ago before all the social media fuck shit was happening. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) And the only reason why I bring up social media, I mean, because it's like... You know, I feel like social media has just been like the devil these days. (laughs) I mean, have y'all been seeing those memes about Will Smith and Jada Pinkett Smith? I mean, it's insane right now. But we're not going to get into that right now today. Um, We're just going to keep talking about these movie theaters and what they need to do. I mean, honestly speaking, I feel like they need to release stuff to the to the drive-ins and just have the drive-ins handle all the newer films and all that at least you know the customers are in a safe place you know they're in their cars your social distance and what have you i mean it's, it's very dystopian i still feel like it's very dystopian to say social distancing keep your mask on and all this that and the other i mean i i i, I don't like it <laughs> it just makes us feel like We're in this whole inhumane cage and what have you. And it's like they tell us stay home and all that. And it's yeah, it just feels like like we're in prison almost. Yeah, they just need to like release the movies in the drive throughs. I mean, honestly, that would probably be the best decision. But if not that um, strike deals with like Netflix, Hulu Amazon Prime, I mean, Prime is already showing, like, a lot of movies on their site that are newer and what have you. Why not just strike deals with them, strike deals with Shudder, you know, make deals. And speaking of Shudder, so the Train of Basan sequel, Peninsula, is definitely dropping this year. So the movie is going to drop in the U.S. and Canada on August 7th of this year, and it's going to show to, like, 150 screens, but... Speaking of like Shutter and striking deals, Shutter has struck a deal with the producers of Train to Basan or the company that is producing Train to Basan. And they're going to actually have that film and it's going to be streamed on their service come 2021. Now, honestly, I know for sure I'm not going to see Train to Basan's Peninsula this year. For sure. Just because of the state that we're in right now. And I know I'm not trying to run to the theaters anytime soon. But I will be willing to wait to see this movie on Shudder. Because, I mean, that's how I've been literally seeing, like, other films being released that I haven't seen before. So, like, movies like Three From Hell, Bliss, Daniel Isn't Real. I mean, I really do like that Shudder is really taking more of a initiative or um what's the word i want to look for 
like they're really being aggressive on trying to get good content for their site or for their app I should say and like I mentioned before I do have a companion with Amazon for those that listen to me regularly that means just more content on my prime you know what I'm saying and I love it there's nothing wrong with it you know what I'm saying but definitely, um, if you haven't seen the trailer to this, uh, because the trailer was released with this, this one looks like a very big budgeted movie, by the way. This one is going to be a lot different from what we saw in the first film. The first film was much more, I felt more intimate, more independent. Um, you know, you didn't have like the super greatest camera angles or the super greatest CGI, but you got at least good enough visual effects and good camera work and a very good heartfelt story where I feel like this one is going to be a lot more big budgeted action pack kind of like a fast and the furious type budget where we're going to get like the same kind of special effects but it's going to be a lot more advanced than the last film that came out and this one is also is going to be a little bit bilingual because there is a bit of English and Korean being used in the film but other than that I'm not going to give too much away you guys should check out the trailer you know check it out wherever you can as we're moving on into the news let's talk about something that is very interesting that came out recently since the the success of Invisible Man Blumhouse has been really trying to get these universal monsters back in action. So pretty much there's like some movies that are being in the works. Um, James Wan, he's going to do the new Frankenstein movie, which I am glad that it's going to happen. John Krasinski, who is the director for A Quiet Place and A Quiet Place 2. He is going to be working on an untitled movie. Karen Kasama. I hope I'm saying that name right. <laughs> but she did movies like Jennifer's Body and The Invitation. And she is going to handle the new Dracula film. Now, the reason why I brought up like the Universal Monsters and everything. So there's been news about Ryan Gosling, which I've been kind of off lately with the news. Sorry, you guys. I mean, you guys noticed like as of late, like all my content hasn't really been news oriented or focused on news that much. But Ryan Gosling is going to be in the new Wolfman movie that's going to be adapted for modern times. And the person handling that film is going to be Lee Wanell. Blumhouse is really trying to get this man to kind of keep making them the dollars. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I mean, hey, I mean, the guy has is no short of like good films i mean he's in charge of all the soft films he's done the insidious movies he did i believe no i think james wan did aquaman but um i'm trying to think of the other movie oh upgrade and it's just like why not get this man who handles horror just like a baby man like you know he he handles it he loves horror and I just like that he is really like taking a new take on Invisible Man. As of today, I still have not seen it. And I'm hearing great things about it. And hearing that is like really great to watch. So I might have to like pull that trigger on Amazon and just rent it out one day. <laughs> and honestly, I mean, I'm glad that they're actually taking, you know, kind of a... I guess canon to like bringing these um, movies back out because they were not going to touch these movies anymore because of the failure of the mummy. And I mean, that's understandable. I mean, who gives a fuck about the mummy anyway? Tom Cruise. Why? <laughs> oh man. But um, with the invisible man being as successful as it is, which we don't get much Invisible Man films, honestly. I mean, I can't think of a movie besides Hollow Man that actually dealt with the Invisible Man, you know, like as more of like a horror figure, you know what I'm saying? Like if you 
see the Invisible Man. It's usually in like an action movie type setting. I feel like, I mean, I remember the last time I seen an Invisible Man in a movie was, I believe, Mystery Men, I believe. And that was like in the early 2000s. Now we're getting more of like the horror characters of these characters, you know, and not just like a Twilight type bullshit. Oh my God. I really do feel like Twilight kind of killed a lot for werewolves who don't really, I feel like, get the much love in movies, you know, like vampires do. Or like the raging psychopaths and what have you. You know, I feel like monsters that need to be focused on like Frankenstein's monster, um, the Invisible Man and the Wolf Man, you know, they're they're getting that treatment again. They're getting that that look, that fear in it. And I like that now the theaters are well not the theaters, but the the industry, like the movie companies, they're actually trying to revive those characters. Because that's what horror movies were about, you know? Like, for people who first started growing up in horror, at least for me, you know, my first thoughts of horror villains were like Frankenstein, were like Dracula, and so on and so forth. And as I was trying to build out this episode and I was reading an article by Blade Disgusting, I mean... It kind of makes you wonder, like, how are they going to treat this film? You know, how is Lee Wynnell going to make this a very interesting film for modern times for people to watch? I mean, I don't know what he's going to do with it. I, I'm trusting his vision on what he wants to do. But, I mean, as far as werewolves go... I just feel like most of the time werewolves have either been in a failed horror movie setting personally to me or a comedy setting like Teen Wolf or some shit like that, you know, or it's just been like in a failed setting like I mentioned before, like fucking Twilight, you know, and and I I know I'm mentioning Twilight and we all know this isn't horror, but I just feel like after that movie and its popularity, or should I say fast popularity? Because I mean, it's not really that popular anymore, <laughs> honestly. And I'm glad it's not. Um, I feel like it killed a lot of like appeal in the, in the scariness of werewolves. You know what I'm saying? Like now we gotta relate werewolves to Taylor Lautner. <laughs> oh my god! But I mean, I I I can't say I hate that too bad because I mean, when Twilight was out, I low key was cheering for Team Jacob. Just saying, I low key did think like the whole vampire shit was like fucking stupid. I mean, why are they glowing? Like, what the hell? But that's enough Twilight news for now. <laughs> but um, let's move on to the last piece of news that I want to talk about. And that is the Bird Box sequel, Mallory. So there's a book sequel to the movie Bird Box, which is taking place 12 years after the events. And this book is mainly focused on Mallory, the main character in Bird Box. So this book is going to be released on July 21st of this year. And Josh Mallerman, who is the writer of this book, he's kind of teasing that there might be a movie adaptation of this shit. You know, he's not really giving much news about it, but we kind of know what's up. And... Considering that Bird Box was very popular when it came out, even though it was a piece of shit, people are still going to flock, and I am myself going to flock to see this sequel when it comes out, even though I said it's a piece of shit for the first one. I do want to see what happens because the premise deals with Mallory getting news that somebody that she cares about, that she thought 
had died is supposedly alive and that's pretty much all that I got as and well that's all we got I should say as far as what the premise of, about what this book is um I am kind of taking a stab that more than likely is going to be Tom because that's the only last surviving character that Mallory actually really cared about besides the kids so yeah there's no possible way that it could be any other character besides him if there is going to be a movie adaptation like I said more than likely that shit probably won't come into the next like couple of years I'm pretty sure um the sale of this book is gonna be very I guess this book is definitely going to be probably one of the best-selling books so far from this year. <laughs> I mean, honestly speaking, I don't know many books that have came out this year. Um, me, I'm not really... I'm I'm somewhat of a reader, but I'm not a strong reader, as I, I should say. I mean, not a strong reader, but I don't... I'm not a fast reader, I should say. Like, I take hella time when it comes to reading. You know, it takes me like about a month to finish a book. And it takes me more of uh, uh, like a couple of months to finish a book that has hella pages. Like if it's like a fucking um, Harry Potter book, it probably would have took me months to finish that shit. <laughs> but that's pretty much the news for this week that I wanted to talk to you guys about. Um, right now I am going to take a break and when I come back I'm going to talk about like some 70s films or a 70s film that I watch in my month of 70s watch that I just thought was a very underrated movie that you guys might want to actually check out or think that's pretty interesting so like you shouldn't say in a scary movie I'll be right back what's your favorite scary so for the past couple of months, I've been kind of asking you guys in my Instagram stories on what type of films should I be focusing on? So this past month was a toss up between 70s films and 80s films. And 70s films is the one thing that won. I was very shocked, but I mean, I was up for the challenge because I myself didn't know many 70s films. Um, I have watched quite a few, though, before I started taking on this challenge. Um, I watched movies like Blackula, Last House on the Left. I remember last podcast when I was talking about this. I couldn't rem remember whether Last House on the Left was a 70s film or not. But going through, like, the list of movies that came out in the 70s, I actually saw that it is a movie that came out in the 70s and or came out during that time era. And I have actually watched it before. So, yeah, Last House on the Left, Carrie, which I'm actually really shocked because I didn't think Carrie came out in the 70s, but I guess it did. Um, I thought it was more of an 80s film than anything, but I guess it makes sense because it doesn't have any of the 80s nostalgic or magic that's usually in, like, 80s films. You get me? But, um, yeah, that movie... And and I spit on your grave and countless others that I watch on um, Deep Red, also the Dario Argento film, Suspiria, also. Um, you know I love my Argento movies. <laughs> this month really did focus on a lot of newer films or films that just don't get much shine. I watched The Hills Have Eyes for the first time. I that will probably be a shock for a lot of you people who are listening right now. You're probably like, why? What's wrong with you? Why are you such a madman? But it was never on stream. It finally made it to stream. And if it was on stream before, I didn't have the time before. So yeah, um, I finally checked that out. And I checked out a countless others, some that are lesser known films like Death by Invitation, The Thirst. And this one film that I'm about to talk to you guys about today the witch who came from the sea now this movie has got to be maybe the most interesting film out of like everything else besides that aren't like super mainstream 
or anything like that. This has got to be like maybe like the most interesting, I guess, lower tiered movies that came out in the 70s. Now, this movie focuses on Molly, who works at this bar called The Boathouse. And not only does she work there, but she's also a loving aunt to her nephews, Tad and Tripoli. And the thing is about Molly is that she has this very disturbed mind of wanting to murder men. And not just any type of men, but just men of like stature and power. And it's a movie that really focuses on mainly like the traumas of childhood, which is what this movie kind of delves into as we go through Molly's adventure, or I should say her, her downward spiral into her deceit into madness built through drugs and alcohol. Now, the movie starts out with her taking care of her nephews, Tad and Tripoli. And we kind of see that she's pretty much like a loving aunt to them, but in a more motherly fashion type way. It seems that the boys, Tad and Tripoli, kind of like, it seems like the boys love their aunt more than they love their mother. For whatever reason, maybe it's dealing with the separation between their mom and the father, who pretty much walked out on the family. As we learn, like, in the beginning of this film, we see that Molly has this sanguineous lust for wanting to kill men, like, just these buff men that are hanging out on the beach. She has this fantasy of just wanting to see them dead. And... It's all live. It's all deep rooted back to like the trauma with her father. Now throughout the film, she's kind of like giving her father like so much gratitude, so much like I guess admiration. But the truth is that this dad was really a scumbag. This dad was raping Molly when she was like a little girl. Um, disturbing scenes that you will see in this film. And there is a lot of disturbing shit that happens in this film, by the way. But the most disturbing, well, I will say the most disturbing things you will see in this film are basically the romanticism of the dad on his daughter. Now, they don't really state how old she was when she got raped by him. But... You see like scenes of, well, like little cutaway scenes to kind of get a glimpse of who Molly really is and what she's trying to like suppress from her memories. And you see scenes of like the dad just like caressing the daughter. Um, You see scenes of him in bed with her and you actually get a full on scene where he has sex with her and he pretty much dies while having sex with her. But that's the thing. That's the main focus of this film is trauma. And not just any type of trauma, but just childhood trauma in general. And the story is like very... I guess it really goes into a direction of like so much destruction that Molly goes through throughout the story between her just jumping from sleeping with her boss, Long John, who is helping her keep her job and a place to stay to her, like her romantic affair with Alexander McPeak, who reminds her of so much of her father, who she later ends up killing. But not only does her trauma takes her into a place of murder and drugs, but it also does damaging effects to the people around her as well as like people like Long John, who has like pretty much romantic feelings for Molly throughout the film. And it's pretty much apparent that he does suffers in every whims of her changes and insanity. But not only that, Tad and Tripoli, who are her nephews, who pretty much admires her 
every way possible, including seeing her as the center of information when she talks about the boys' two favorite football stars, Sam Walters and Austin Slay, who played for the Rams. It made me wonder when we were in the final scene of this movie where the police finally kind of caught wind of who their killer is and they were chasing down Molly and Molly is pretty much having the boys feed her drugs and alcohol till she overdoses. And it made me think about like what kind of effect did it have on those boys? I mean, it was enough that her destruction was happening to her sister and people that she was just randomly killing. But she's also get traumatizing, not only just herself. Well, not only what was she traumatized, but she is also traumatizing and using a cycle of trauma to now her nephews who have to see her die right in front of their eyes it's interesting because um looking at this movie it kind of reminds me of other serial killers who were actually abused when they were kids and that uh, trauma and that trauma pretty much you know not really the catalyst for their murders but was the contributing factor of why they were killing you know serial killers like eileen wernos who was abused as a kid who did sex jobs for like cigarettes at the age of 11, who got raped and impregnated by her grandfather by the age of 14. And when she was doing her murders, I mean, spent her time as a prostitute. Mary Bell, who was arrested at 11 because she committed a murder. She was sexually abused and was used in child sex slavery. And the most famous one of them all, John Wayne Gacy, who was sexually abused by a neighbor who was close to the family. He was abused as a young boy. So it was interesting to see like a movie that kind of portrays like the outline of like how some of these killers are. And they really kind of like focus a lot on Molly and her destruction. And that's what kind of makes it an interesting slasher film, by the way. You know, like usually like with slasher films, we're more focusing on the survivors. But in this film, we're focusing more on the actual killer and their spiral into insanity. You know, it was more like movies like American Psycho, Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer, or even the Ted Bundy movie, or even Devil's Rejects. You know, a more or less Devil's Rejects because it is nowhere three-dimensional with the characters. <laughs> but for the 70s, for them to focus on a killer whose trauma that we have to focus on and seeing why they're doing it, it created more of a sympathetic character in a way. Versus in most, like, slasher films in the 70s, we mainly just don't really know who the killer is and when we do find out who the killer is they are suffering from some type of mental health issue that was one thing that was always overly used i feel like sometimes in 70s flicks that a lot of these characters suffer from some type of mental disorder i mean maybe maybe that's just me maybe it's the movies that i watch but I felt like sometimes in the 70s flicks with like some of the serial killers, the ones that that end up having like some kind of um, obsession, they always have like some type of mental disorder or mental health issue. Um, like in the movie Torso, Franz, the art teacher, he had he was being blackmailed by a couple of students, but he had childhood trauma from seeing his brother die right in front of his eyes because his brother tried to help out this little girl get her doll off the cliff but he fell to his death and that pretty much traumatized Franz for the rest of his life and I mean I guess it's 
one way to kind of justify why he was killing um sexy coeds <laughs> in the movie torso um in toolbox murder the owner vance kingsley he was very traumatized by the death of his daughter and he was on a murdering crusade of murdering sinners and he pretty much kidnapped one of the characters Lori, who he just thought was like a very strong resemblance to his daughter Kathy now his nephew Kent in the same movie is also suffering from some type of mental health issue because he ends up killing Vance and he ends up rescuing Lori but ends up raping her and saying that they're going to be married and then actually admits to killing her brother Joey who was supposed to be his friend by the way to kind of help him find Lori in the first place and what we also learned from Kent also is that he supposedly had an incestuous relationship with Kathy which is probably one of the reasons why she ended up dead was probably because of him but that's just some of the films that kind of like focus on killers and make them more like they have more mental health issues which is why they went on a killing spree whereas there are some killers like like Molly you kind of do sympathize with like Blackula I mean he pretty much self-sacrificed himself to death after he lost Tina twice actually to two accidental deaths one was from a gunfight the other was from an accidental spiking to the heart another movie was Carrie White where you kind of sympathize with this killer because she was ex being excessively bullied by both her mom and her classmates so to see someone like Molly in the witch who came from the sea and you see that her trauma was coming from like being raped by her father you kind of give like some type of sympathy for her honestly and, it, and this shit was so fucking crazy because most of the time we don't want to sympathize with the killers like we don't sympathize with the desert dwellers in the hills have eyes when they were killing off the carter family and we didn't sympathize when they got killed by the remaining of those members we didn't sympathize with krug who killed mary in last house of the left and her parents pretty much got revenge on them we definitely sure as hell if you ever seen this movie the original i spit on your grave we didn't sympathize with the hillbillies who raped jennifer hills like it was just no possible way but in this film it does make you want to sympathize with the main character even though she's going out murdering men and we see that she is just like a mess altogether, especially when she takes drugs and alcohol and that's when the truth really does come out about her and that's when like the evil side is really coming out of her is when she is on drugs and alcohol because in one of the scenes she ends up killing well after she kills McPeak she ends up going to bed with Long John and she's pretty much a bloody mess. So yeah, I mean, if you guys want to check out The Witch Who Came From The Sea, it is on Tubi. Definitely check it out. It is worth your time to see. Other than that, I'm about to take a break and when we come back, we are going to have our outro. Wendy. Stay away! Darling, light of my life. I'm not going to hurt you. You didn't let me finish my sentence. I said, I'm not going to hurt you. I'm just going to bash your brains in. I'm going to bash them right the fuck in. <laughs> All right, guys, we are at our outro right now, and we are at our must-watch Tubi movie of the week. 
So the must watch movie of the week will be Torso, which came out in 1973. It is a slasher film. And I pretty much talked about it in the last segment where I was talking about 70s films that I watched. So if you guys want to check that film out, it's definitely worth watching. It's crazy because like, I thought I didn't watch this film before, but I actually did. It's It was actually kind of like, there was a couple of films that I've watched before that I totally forgot that I watched. I swear sometimes I'm like, damn dude, I need to stop drinking while I'm watching these movies. <laughs> Cause it's funny because like, I watched pieces before, but I didn't think I watched pieces before until like I saw certain scenes and I was like, wait, I've seen this movie before. <laughs> and when I got halfway through it, I was like, I have seen this movie before, what the hell? <laughs> so yeah, I'm just saying, man, like, I know I like to have a good time, but fuck. <laughs> but anyway, definitely check out um, Torso. It's definitely worth a watch. I mean, it's definitely like one of those Italian slashers that are pretty interesting. Definitely came out in the 70s, so you know, it's a lot of like mental health um, killers and sexuality in the in these films. Um, but other than that, I am out. This is pretty much a late episode that I'm trying to get pumped through right away. So if you guys see this coming out either Monday or Tuesday or whenever, you know, just know that this was a quick episode or actually a late episode, I should say. That I've been trying to get out because of, well, shit, <laughs> I have no good excuse. <laughs> um, definitely expect an episode from me this weekend. Um, it is going to be another collab with the girl Dimey Horror, so yeah, look out for that this coming weekend. Other than that, your boy is out. Um, you guys could follow me on on uh, pretty much wherever, like Instagram, YouTube, um, Twitter, which is Walter Doom One. But other than that, it's your boy signing out for another episode of Let's Talk About Horror. It's your boy Walter Doom. This is America. Don't let him catch you slipping now. Black Lives Matter.